First of all, I'm, love, I'm in love with the city already. I'm thinking of moving. It's a great city. It's great to having you here. And I'll be talking about asset transactions at a petabyte scale with MarkLogic Server. That refers to maybe our, one of our largest deployments. And now you can achieve that in a clustered environment. I'm Nuno. I'll put my email here, but it will be kind of useless. If you reach me on Twitter, that will be really, really easy. Portuguese born, I did all my college in Portugal in 2008. I got snatched by IBM Research in New York, got working there, worked in Toronto. And now I work for a cool Silicon Valley company called MarkLogic that does a document database. Random stuff I like, dinosaurs, photography. I'm an open source guy, so you can find a lot of stuff that I do in GitHub. And, well, I travel every week, so I grew in fond of traveling. Any questions so far? No. I'm quite an instructor myself, so that was my past and my present. This is what I see as my future in this talk. I was just right now preparing stuff to show you, so. So, how many of you knows what MarkLogic is? One, a database, okay, that's good. So I'm going to start by just defining what it is. I'm going to try to take as little time as possible, but just give you a frame, because it's actually important, it actually matters to scaling a database, how it works, and what it is, and why it's different from what you're used to. If you look from a history perspective, we have like database ancestors I'm not going to talk about, some people in the room will be familiar with them. Some others, like me, weren't even born. And by the way, whoever gets all the side note annotations that I have gets a prize in the end, and the fine prize. I just thought of that. Uh, but after that, what happened was that Oracle came with the relational database. Uh, and what they did was they told you, hey, use this model. It's really cool. COD did it. You put everything in tables, right? And actually, if you do this, we'll give you a query language that you can ask any question against your data. So distill your books, your charts, your invoices, put them into tables, and now you can ask any question against that data. And that was really a big thing, and that's why Oracle dominates and crushed everyone, right? Now, something happened in history that most people didn't realize it relates at all to databases, and that's when the search engine came. No one thought of this as a database problem or something that databases could do, but this really changed the way that we perceived the way how we can get data. So Google came and says, ask a question against the full internet. And you go like, really? And it just works, right? So in MarkLogic, the idea was, can we leverage that and do the same step that the relational database did and say, hey, you can have any structure of data that you want, ingest everything and ask any question. OK? So that's was kind of like the fundamentals to create the company. So we are a one product company. We have a database. Some things that are similar is we have asset, backups, replication, a query language. It's not SQL. SQL is not very good for unstructured information for documents, in case some people haven't realized it. Uh, it's built on a C++ core. It scales up to the petabyte. I would say that's probably something that is similar to other, other databases that you are familiar with. So let me just show you how it looks like. This is actually some XQuery code. This is actually a parser for Mustache. Who here has used Mustache? So whoever used it, this is how you write a parser, a proper parser in XQuery to do Mustache, which shows like it's actually a little more advanced than what you would expect in SQL. It allows you to do a little bit more things. And it might not be perfect. You might not like it. But it's a little better to do unstructured information, at the very least. So that's one of the differences is that you do unstructured information. So you store documents, you store schemaless stuff. And that gives you like one solution for a problem that everyone had, that is the alter table problem. Like just going there, altering your table. If you do schemaless data design, all you do is you store a document. And if you put one phone or two phones or three phones, that's not really what matters. So we are designed to do that. We mostly focus on XML, but we can do JSON as well. And that's a difference from what you're used to. Another thing that is different is that you can store text in binaries. And you can even annotate the binaries with metadata and then search on that metadata. But the main thing is that 
the guys that built MarkLogic were Paul Peterson, the guy from Google, and Chris Lingblad that came from UltraSeq. And the idea was, can we make a database built on the core of a search engine? So search is completely native to MarkLogic, and we'll talk a little bit about more, more on that. So bottom line, no tables, no rows, no columns. You think documents, you think file system, you think URIs, you're putting your documents there, and then you do your questions against it. And the main message here, and the reason why you need this, if you are working with things like documents, if you are working with things like relational tables, you're fine. If you're working with things like documents, the main message here is, please stop shredding your data into tables and then reconstructing it every single time you need it, and just start storing it as, as it is. So that's the main message I have for this. Another thing that you have different, and it's a similarity to CouchDB, Slide doesn't change. There we go. Is that we have an application server. So we're a database built on a search core, and we have an application server. And this comes from a very easy realization, which is who has exposed a database without an application server, right? So our application server is also in the same C++ code as the search stuff and the database stuff. It's all one binary. And this allows you a single tier perspective of all these things, which gives you things like easy geospatial, an HTTP client, facets, alerting. And for instance, you can store applications in the database and serve them directly with MarkLogic. Some of you might be familiar with Couch Apps. And it's built on XQuery, which is that language that I showed you. So what can you do when you have something like this? I did this very short demo for one of our customers where I got Futon from CouchDB, and I actually implemented it with MarkLogic just to show that you could do it. And that's what the kind of thing that you can do when you have an HTTP API. You can just implement it in any product, and you're not bound to any extension of any vendor. So you can just go here, create a database, call it Nuno. If it's a demo, it's going to crash, right? This is in GitHub, by the way. Oh, there we go. That exists. That doesn't exist, does it? And you can create a new document, add a field, save the document, even see the source. So if you look at it, it's like on 5983. <laughs> so the default port is 5984 for CouchDB. So I just put minus one so I could remember. Guys, go back to the presentation. So what is so cool about this is that for years and years, we've been, we've been exposing our database with SQL commands, and we send it over the wire, right? And we've believed that that's going to solve our data problems, the data independence, because everyone has SQL. But in reality, how many of you have tried that? Actually have SQL over the wire and then migrate to another database? Did it work? So you actually think that you have a standard language and it's going to work, but then all the extensions just don't allow it to work, right? And if you have an HTTP server, actually showing, what you're showing is your content, the things that you want to serve. So you stop exposing your database out over the wire and you start exposing your data. And that's a really good thing because then I can do something like I just did with Futon. I just get the app, make it running on MarkLogic, no problem. Any questions so far? All good? So what is MarkLogic? Unstructured information, the range, terabyte to petabyte, sub-second response times, Data immediately durable, so unlike Lucene, where you put something and you have to wait for the index to be ready so you can query the thing, right? In MarkLogic, it's our design goal that this has to be immediate. And then there's another thing that is really interesting, which is when our customers start to get all that data into a server or into a multiple nodes of servers, and then they go like, and I can do analytics on this. And they start crossing the bridge of what is OLTP and what is OLAP. And they start thinking, oh, I can do analytics on this stuff. And that's something that, at least for me, is really exciting. So about unstructured information, this is, we call it unstructured information. You probably know it as documents. I know it as documents. The marketing folks know it as unstructured information. And why is this relevant? Why does every single vendor that does JSON or XML talks about this? The reason is it helps on scale. It really helps you scale a database, the fact that you don't have to do joins all the time. 
So it's very important that you don't have the mismatch of actually putting a telephone and putting it into separate tables. You just have a telephone in the document of your user. That makes it extremely simple to actually do full text search, to do database-like queries, and even do the analytics, because everything is just on that level. So I like to use this jacket analogy. In the relational world, what you do is every time you want to store your jacket, you take the buttons, the thread, the wool, the silk, and you just put it into individual buckets. It's kind of like your OCD, right? And then you go and you reassemble that all the single times. And if you're doing something in documents, what you do is you store the jacket. Then if you want a sleeve and you want to do a new jacket, it's okay, but you cut it off. In reality, you're storing the jacket itself. And that's the main thing if you want to scale something like documents. Now, that's a very complicated problem to have. And historically, everyone failed doing it. You had XML databases, you had hierarchical databases, you had object something databases, and they all failed, right? It was a really complicated problem to do. Why? Because you have hierarchical, and then how do you do an index for that? Can I leverage my relational index? Can I leverage the literature that exists? And the answer is mostly no. So as I said, in Mark Logic, we are built on something that is, looks like a search engine. So how many of you are familiar with an inverted index here? Almost everyone. TFIDF, it's all search geeks, isn't it? <laughs> awesome. So bottom line, what you have, for all, those of you that are not like one person, uh, what you have is an index like in the back of a book that says, hey, this word is in this page, except that it's this word is in this document, right? Like Berlin is in document 123, 126, 130, and 152. And you have to keep them in order so that when you're selecting from this index, you can do the merge sort really fast. So you have Berlin, buzzwords, fast, NoSQL, Hadoop, and now you can just find these lines. And if you search for Berlin, but not buzzwords, right? I can just go and out of the index, I get, okay, these are the Berlins, these are not buzzwords, and I can just remove the contributions from them and just give you the response. So what am I doing? Instead of having to go through each single document that you have in your database, you just have to go through those that you get from the index. That's what an inverted index is. How did Mark Logic leverage that to actually do unstructured information? We added information about, for instance, parent-child relationships, presentation title. So the way it works is when you ingest a document into MarkLogic and it checks that there's a title on a presentation, it does a hash of that. You can think of like child colon colon presentation, sorry, title, right? And it does a hash. And then in that entry of the inverted index, we just put the document. So now when you search for I want something that has Berlin in the presentation title. I can immediately go, oh, presentation title, it's here, right? And Berlin, it's here. Then we also add another index that is like element value. So if you have something like year 2001, we'll get that when we're indexing. We'll hash it and also put it there. So you say year 2001 and the title of a presentation that includes Berlin. And the more complex you're making this query, the easier it is for MarkLogic to figure it out. Now, this is the only patent we have, almost. But it's a pretty cool thing that allows you to do unstructured information really, really fast. Well, then we just went nuts. And we just thought, hey, we can leverage this for more stuff. We can do directories. For instance, you can say, oh, it's in the public directory. It's also on the index. Or you can put labels, like we call it collections, like Gmail labels. And you can say, oh, it's in NoSQL track. And now you can search for something that has a title with Berlin buzzwords of year 2001 with collection NoSQL on the public, that is, published folder. Apart from that, we also added something saying an editor can read these documents, which means that security in MarkLogic actually makes you faster. If you can only read 10 documents out of a petabyte, that index will immediately tell you that you can only read 10 documents, and there's no way around it. So it's an implicit index you use every single time. So security helps your performance. This is actually a funny story. When I joined MarkLogic, I don't know, I, I like crashing things. So the first thing I try to do is crash it burn, it, to burn it down. I just wanted to do it, and I couldn't do it. And that's because the more I was making, I was making it more complex, but in reality, I was just giving it more clues. What I needed was not to give any clues, and then I would crash it down. And that's because of this architecture. 
And it comes down to Darwin. It's not the strongest of species that survives, nor the most intelligent. It is the one that is most adaptable to change. And that's what documents are really cool for. OK? I think I have a, a friendly crowd here. Everyone is like search guys, so everyone likes documents already. Yeah? So just some definitions before we go on, on acid versus cap. I have no interest in talking about these topics, as that's not the objective of, I have interest outside of here. But I have interest to know what's the sense of the audience. For instance, everyone knows what acid is? All good. What about cap? Who heard of uh, cap? Sometimes. <laughs> so bottom line is that people, I think, forgot that acid is a good thing if you can pull it off. If you can't pull it off, it's not a good thing. But if you can pull it off, well, it really makes it easy for you to develop. You don't have to think about consistency. You don't have to think about these things. These things are supposed to be guarantees. For developers, for database engineers, maybe that's meh, I don't care. But for developers, that's a good thing. It helps you, right? The bad thing is, how do I scale it horizontally? How do I make sure that it's highly available? Those are the things that are more complicated about CAP, about, sorry, about ACID, right? And then on CAP, which is a paper by Eric Brewster that just defines Brewer. OK, good. Uh, it just defines like consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. And he says, I mean, I'm putting this very generic. You pick two. And for instance, we have some guys from React, which are supposed to be AP, correct? According to that blog post, I try not to make any judgments myself, because I didn't want that to be the focus of the talk. And bo bottom line, you can have a consistent available application. And that's something like MySQL. And you can have a consistent partition tolerant, uh, tolerant uh, database, or you can have a partition tolerant and available database. And basically, what it says is you pick two. Now, us. As database implementers, we know it's not just that simple. The world is not just three vertices. There's a lot of design decisions that you're going to make that are going to compromise in one way or the other what you can do. I already showed you what MarkLogic set up to do, right? Unstructured, fast, real time, and on the terabytes to petabyte scale, right? But you make design decisions, and the world is not just three vertices. Not every person. React, just because it's AP, is not going to have the same implementation as other, any other database that just chooses that vertices. And that's something that people need to realize. It's like, sometimes you don't need what you think you need. And you have to think what you really need. And you should use that. The world is not three databases, bottom line. This is a tweet by Salvatore, by the way. OK, so 20 minutes to present this. So now, how do you do ACID transactions at scale? Yay, that's why you're all here, I hope. Right? <laughs> so bottom line, what were the problems? So how many here are familiar with the problem of scaling an inverted index? <laughs> Three. <laughs> wow, good audience. <laughs> so not a lot of people, but if you think of it, the inverted index is like this big chunk of things that every time you get a word, you put it there, and then you have a list that needs to be ordered, right? And every time you insert a document, you might have 80,000 words, and you need to update 80,000 places, right? So if you think about guaranteeing ACID over this, what is ACID? I mean, you have to guarantee that it's durable, which means you have to give a response to the person and say, hey, this is here, and if you query it, it's consistent for everyone that is querying it, right? So it's very, very complicated if you have a list of integers that you have to update in so many, so many places. So how did MarkLogic leverage that? What was the decision that made that simple? And we did something called LSM tree, log structure merge tree. I took notes so I didn't make a mistake like Ari Brewster. <laughs> and bottom line, what happens is, just imagine, every time you're writing to MarkLogic, you're actually never writing to disk. You don't write to disk. That doesn't happen. What you write is in memory as well, always in memory. And it's always journaled. So if the computer goes down, we replay the journal. So you're fine. You're durable. But you always write to memory. And when you write to memory, you write to like this folder-like structure that has indexes, the inverted index, and the trees, which are your documents. Now, that space over there in memory is limited to like maybe 40, 50 megabytes, 100 megabytes, depends on the computer that you have. 
but you never have to write to disk and you never have to change the full index. So bottom line, if you look at terms of complexity, we just reduce the n by a lot and that makes it very, very easy to make it fast and to make it real time. So you do that when the memory is full, when you reach a certain threshold, you push it to disk. And now a new memory, that is a new memory, we call it stand, that is on the buffer just gets picked and a new buffer gets created. And you do this all the time. So you're always pushing. So in Mark Logic, we have an append-only model of data. So you just keep, you start another tree, you start like writing there, creating the index, pushing it to disk. And you do this and you just go and create these stands. So let me just show you that happening. So I'm going to actually load some documents here. So I created an ATL process for you guys a buzzwords database. I'm going to click start loading. And now if I go to the actual up place, I can see those things being pushed to disk. See, as I'm ingesting documents, they're being pushed. And it's exactly serialized as a folder. You can even go inside and look at the indexes and the trees in this structure. And it's just going. But one thing that you might notice is that it's not always growing. It's going to start to shrink as well. And it shouldn't. Like, it should be like forever growing kind of thing. And as you can see, in the end, we have like three of those things. And now we have one in memory and three on disk. When you query against Mark Logic, as a developer, you don't have to care, care about this. This is database of geek stuff that you don't care about, you always see what's in memory and what's on disk just the same. You don't worry about it. But what happened that made all those things be reduced? And what happened was you just push into disk, push into disk, push into disk. But now when you do a query for Berlin minus buzzwords, it means that in all these folders, there's a separate index that you need to read. Also, if you inserted a document foo, for instance, 10 times, there's 10 copies of the document foo in different folders. It can be. So what is happening in the background is that Mark Logic is realizing at some point that it has like CPU cycles to go and clean up. It cleans up, actually creates a new folder, copies the things that have not been deleted, merges the indexes, optimizes it so you don't have two indexes, and it even does recalculation on memory, puts it all there, and when it's done, it just cleans up the two old ones. And in CouchDB, they call it compaction, and in Mark Logic, we call it merging. So what does, this what does this give you? It gives you two things, most of all. It gives you zero latency ingestion and indexing. So it means that you can ingest and immediately give a response. And it gives you fast ingestions with transactions. That's the objective of us doing it. It's not because it's cool or because we read a paper. It's because we wanted to solve this problem of scaling an, an inverted index. This is what we did to make it work. So now you can say, you can put anything to Mark Logic, and your index will be immediately available. I remember a story with a customer that went like, so we'll buy this Mark Logic thing if you can update our inverted index in less than 10 seconds. And I remember our VP of engineering said, we can only do zero. And they didn't find it was a good joke, and it wasn't a joke. By design, we can only do it like that. We cannot put nine seconds waiting. You can put a sleep if you want, but there's nothing else you can do. It's designed to do like this. And you should realize that these things are all trade-offs. It's not magical or better or worse. It's just better for this use case. OK? All good? So now you reach the limit of a single server. And what do you do, right? And well, I read this. I just, I sometimes follow like tweets on NoSQL and people say the funniest thing and this is one of them. You cannot take a car, a server, grow it 10 times and expect to get a mining truck, right? So how do we do the horizontal scaling so it makes this work? So far, if you look at it, everything is like the stands have the indexes and the trees, right? So there's no centralized index. So we're pretty well built to scale, but how do we do the rest of actually creating and putting new nodes? So in Mark Logic, what you do, like in other, other databases, is sharding. A database is nothing more, more than a level of abstraction. 
because it helps developers to reason about their data. They connect to a database. They don't want to care about the shards. They want to care about databases, right? That's what I understand. And then we assure even distribution across nodes there. We don't do consistent hashing or something fancy like that. We do something more trivial. And that's most of all because we have the universal index, which is always a hash lookup. And so we can always go back up and give a response very fast. So all we need is 15 minutes. All we need is to assure even distribution on the nodes. But we don't rely on it to actually get the document later on. And then what we have in the nodes when you insert a mark logic is a group of stands and trees. So you insert there, it goes to one of the partitions. And they will be as evened out as possible. I, I saw a, a talk about solar yesterday and about computing scores on TF-IDF. Well, actually, mark logic defers that to something that we call a E node, and we do it as global IDF. So we don't have that problem. And that's what I was asking. I actually asked a question about that. And so it makes sense to make the indexes in the same place as the trees, because that just makes it very, very easy to scale. We have a shared nothing cluster. That means that no node is taking control over anything. We have these things as e nodes, and one of the smartest things a customer ever told me is like, so it's a server that acts like a client. And I'm like, well, if you think of other databases, sort of, because you don't have to know where the file is. You just go to that e-host, and he knows where the files is, are, and he's responsible for contacting them and coordinating kind of like the response. So what happens here is you have all these nodes. They all communicate with each other like a ping. They have like a heartbeat mechanism. And if one of them goes down, then all of them start voting and say, hey, that guy is down. That guy is down. And if more than 50%, actually n divided by 2 plus 1, of the hosts goes down, then what happens is they kick him out of the cluster. And someone else will pick up on the data that he has. OK? So let's talk about locking now. So any questions so far? So what about locking? If you have been paying any attention and you know what MVCC is, you probably thought they're doing MVCC. And what, what is MVCC? It's the append-only database model. It means that every time you write foo to disk, you don't actually care if you never go to the same place and update that file. Okay? You always uh, append something new. Like you have foo, and now you have foo2 on a different location on disk. And this makes an append-only database. The way that we implement it in Mark Logic, and that's because we need fast merge, that compaction thing that you saw happening, is we have an inserted timestamp and a deleted timestamp. And then when you do a query, we have like an artificial index that just tells like on this point in time, what are the things that are available. This also gives you something that is high throughput. So queries don't require locks, and queries and updates don't conflict. And it gives you it's asset compliant, which is an important thing for us, because we want it to be asset compliant. So I think this shows it pretty well. So just imagine the green things to be inserts and the red things to be deletes. So if you are using MVCC, it's like for each transaction that you have, you just put the files. And you can imagine that there's an imaginary line that has all the files at that given point in time, right? So if I'm in moment seven there, where it says query, and I do a question against Mark Logic or anything that is doing MVCC, what happens is you have all the documents that are available there, and you have an index that says, oh, these documents, and actual documents are not the URIs, actually the version, the correct version, right? So I can continue to write to Mark Logic without acquiring any lock, because I never update anything in place. So that means that queries don't need to lock. Let's imagine, and I think this is fairly common, you have a transaction um, separation of 20% updates and 80% queries, right? In Mark Logic server, you just consider 20% of transactions because the other 80% don't require locks, don't do anything that is special. So MVCC just solves it. So that means that you reduce to 20% of the transactions that you considered to have in terms of locking. There's no read locks, nothing for queries. Still, we have to write. And when we write, I wrote this thing here. Just imagining two shards, 
and inserting some documents so you can see how it works. And it works really as a two-phase commit. So if you were 100% right-bound, MVCC wouldn't help you at all. But if you are like 20%, this is how the locking happens. Now, one thing that is interesting is that the locking doesn't happen at the document level because that would be completely useless. We never actually replace any document anyway. It happens only at the URI level. That's the thing that you can replace. It's foo.json, foo.json twice. So you cannot have two foo.jsons, OK? So let's imagine here, you insert foo and you insert par. And what it happens is one of the shards takes control of this transaction. It says 1, 2, 3 goes to A, and 2, 3, 4 goes to B. And then one of them says, OK, I'm the leader for this transaction. He's not going to be the leader for all transactions, but he'll be the leader for this one. And then the other guy says, yeah, I'm prepared. I'm like, then commit, dude. And he commits. And then it says distributed end. And as you can see, on the timestamps there, you immediately have 1, 2, 3. So fragment ID 1, 2, 3 is in foo.json and was created on 1. And 2, 3, 4, bar.json has been created on 1 as well. Right? So now if I do a question on 1, I don't have to lock anything because I know what's available on 1. I can continue to create and delete documents. So now let's say that I insert foo again. I do an update. Right? I'm inserting a child with stuff. And what I do is I create a new fragment called 345. So I never update that foo. I never go there and update it. I just append. Right? And when I commit it, all I do is I say the other one was deleted on 2 and this was created on 2. Once again, now if I do a question against moment 2 in the database, there's no problem. You can do that and you can continue to write. You don't require a lock to do this. Finally, we delete both documents. And as you can see, all it happens, same two-phase commit, and we just say, OK, they're deleted. So I'm not going to talk about availability, because it's not the topic of this conversation. But this is just a challenge if you want on the questions. Feel free to ask something about availability, whatever you want to ask. We have a lot of a lot of customers with a lot of uh, running things that are very sensitive, so probably have an answer for it. And if you want to try it out, go to developermarklogic.com, try it out, tweet to me, and ask me things. I'm more than help, uh, welcome to help. And power of imagination makes us infinite. Credit to Julian that did this background and is an amazing graphical artist. And that's it. Just a funny quote in the end. Something also I saw in the NoSQL. You have database problem. You research blog and hacker news. You start using NoSQL product. Now you not know anymore if you have problem. So that's it. Questions? Okay, I didn't get that. What other transactions? Is that a couple of inserts or updates of objects that you call a transaction? Uh, it was an update of two documents. So the question was, <laughs> I told you. So the question was, what was that thing that I was showing? What was the transaction? Was it actually on an object? What were those two things? And now what was the boundary of the transaction? And the boundary of the transaction was two inserts, so two statements in the first transaction, insert foo and insert bar. Then it was an update on foo, and then it was on the same transaction, delete foo and delete bar. That's what we saw so far. Does that answer the question? No, not really. I think, um, could I have a transaction where I insert something, then get some other document, and then insert Good another question. document, and have a, do I have those? Bundles those are transactions isolated yes. from one another? Yes, you can do a lot of combinations of transactions, and that's a very interesting question. Uh, you can combine them, but you should be careful about what you ask for. Because when you combine them, what happens is that MarkLogic runs on read write blocks. So, I mean, for instance, if you ask for each document in the database, update document, you're locking all the data. Right? And you don't want to do that. Probably what you want to do is a bulk transformation, I would assume.
but that's something that you can do in Mark Logic. And let me show you a table, actually. You can ask another question? Yeah, yeah I'll just pick on Kind of preparing. I mean, if you have such restrictions, then actually doing transactions is not that hard. Um, and people have been knowing how to do it with MVCC since a couple of decades. Mm -hmm. And the question is? No, that's just, <laughs> just a remark. Yes. Okay, so that's how we mix queries in the same statement and different transactions for updates. Thanks. Any other question? Yes? It's, you showed that, uh, that three tiers, with, I forget the exact name, but like the E nodes, and then at the bottom there were partitions. Mm -hmm. Is that, and one of the nodes had arrows to two partitions. Does that imply that the partitions are fully shared, that disk is shared across all of the middle tier, or is the partition like directly co located with the middle tier? So you, the question was in each of the nodes that had shards, do you need to have them on a shared disk, like a SAN, yeah. or local disk? They can be on a SAN or local disk. If you have them on the SAN, it makes availability a little different because then you have you, the other node needs to be able to do the same mount point and you need to fence it. And if you have it on local disk, then you just have to do replication over the wire with our protocol. Does that answer the question? Yes? Uh, we don't store it in a central place. We store it in each of them, but what we send up, because it's always a two-phase process, it's like get the things from the index, now calculate, now actually I need these documents if you need to filter, and because of that we send iterators up, we don't send scores. And those iterators allow you to at least to some extent, I'm not the guy that did the C++ code, so I don't know to what extent, but allow them to have some degree of global IDF. So it's not per partition. But that's what I meant. I'm sorry if I wasn't very clear. Good? Anything else? OK, we should probably move to the next speaker now, okay. um, since we're running late on the schedule. Uh, Thanks for coming, guys. If you want anything else, just find me outside. Kick me, ask me something, do whatever you want, OK? Thanks.